Okay. Um, welcome back. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's an early session today, but from now on, we will always have all these uh, Thursday sessions because uh, we need them, actually. Uh, remember, we were uh, discussing duality theorems. On uh, Monday, we have uh, discussed a weak duality theorem and its corollaries. Uh, what was the weak duality theorem saying? Take two feasible points from a primal and a dual problem. Uh, the one that you're minimizing will always be an upper bound for the one that you're maximizing. This was weak duality theorem. And it has two corollaries. Corollary one was active when their objective function values are equal. In this scenario, both of the feasible solutions we took from the respective problems are supposed to be optimal solutions because they both attained the bounds that they can have. And corollary two was saying that if one of the problem is unbounded, if th that means there is no bound, that means the other problem has to be infeasible. But it's not an if and only if type statement. So if one problem is infeasible, the other can also be infeasible, not necessarily unbounded. If one problem is infeasible, the other can never have an optimum solution. Why is coming from the strong delta theorem? Uh, any questions from the weak duality corollaries or on the machinery on how we take the dual kind of thing? Uh, you guys have the second, uh, well, have the homework and study site associated with this topic. Uh, most, some of the questions you could have been, uh, you, you, were, you were able to solve actually until today. The rest will be uh, clearer after today's lecture. All right. Now, this brings us to the strong delta theorem. What does strong delta theorem says? Okay, take your primal dual pair. It says, if one of the problem has an optimal solution, all right, so does the other one. Okay. And their objective function values are equal, of course. We have seen it from corollary, to corollary one. One more important thing coming from this duality theorem, strong duality, is that let B be an optimal basis for one of the problems, all right? Yeah, so my primal's optimal basis is B, then my optimal dual solution is CBB inverse. All right? So let's read the, the, the theorem again. If one problem has an optimal solution, so does the other one. That's what the statement says. And if B is the optimal basis for P, then CBB inverse is the optimal dual solution. So this is actually giving us some as a methodology to find the dual solution once we know the optimal primal solution by just CBB inverse. All right, let's go through the proof of this theorem. <coughs> All right, if one of the problem has an optimal solution, this is what we're going to utilize, right? Because that's the if statement. We will consider the fact that if holds, and then we were going to prove the then part of the statement. All right, if one problem has an optimal solution, all right, let's take the primal, let's take a canonical four max problem. Well, uh, the dual of this canonical max problem is canonical for min. All right, okay. Um, just keep this in mind. This is the form that we can find the optimal basis from, the simplex form, right? So we may utilize this format too. But the dual of this problem is this, minimize WB subject to WA greater than or equal to C and W not negative. All right. First of all, <clears throat> let's go back a couple of weeks and remember the fundamental theorem of LP. What was the fundamental theorem saying? It says it had two parts, actually. If the problem has a feasible solution, then there exists a basic feasible solution. That was first part. And the second one part was saying that if the problem has an optimal solution, then it must have an optimal basis. All right? So I'm assuming that the, the primal has an optimal solution. Then I can safely assume that there is an optimal basis B. All right? There is an optimal basis B. Now, that's what I'm going to utilize to prove that the dual is also optimal. Okay. Then this is what I can safely assume, right, by a fundamental theorem of LP. Then there is an optimal basis, and this optimal basis corresponds to basic variables and non-basic variables. Okay, fine. Now, I need to prove that uh, this basis will give me... Um, 
an optimal dual solution. Okay, so let's take this W, C, B, B inverse. Since I know B is optimal, B is a basic feasible solution, so B inverse exists, right? So let's multiply this B inverse by C, B, because the theorem itself actually wants us to prove that anyway. Let's take that W and prove that that W is optimal, and in fact that W is, well, first we're gonna prove that that W is feasible, and then we're gonna prove that that W is optimal. This will finish our proof, yeah? Because then we, what, what did we do? We assumed that there is an optimal BFS, and now we proved that the dual, corresponding dual, also has an optimal solution, which is CBB inverse. Okay, so let's take that CBB inverse. Remember the simplex table? The table format, the very first week <coughs> that we were online, I was talking about this, right? Uh, at any iteration, any iteration. Uh, here we have the basic variables. Here, we're actually multiplying everything with B inverse from left. That was what's happening in the, the matrix notation. And in order to get identity underneath the basic variables, and in order to get zero underneath the basic variables in row zero coefficient, we need C B B inverse A minus C in row zero. All right? And this was the right answer. This is my matrix for any B. You have also solved homeworks with that, so you, you must be familiar with this topic. Given a B, I can immediately construct this complex table. Okay, then, uh, for the B that I'm assuming from fundamental theorem of, of B, I just construct a simplex table. Okay. Now, remember, the B I took from is construct corresponding to my X star, which is an optimal solution. So my row zero should be non-negative because this B is optimal, right? So what is row B zero? CBB inverse A minus C is non-negative and CBB inverse is non-negative. Okay, let's make the change of variables. Put W instead of CBB inverse. That's not what I assumed anyway. W was CBB inverse. All right. When I do that assumption, well, this is what I found. Wa greater than equal to C, W non-negative. Let's go back to the dual. That is my dual. Wa greater than equal to C, W non-negative. So in the optimal simplex table, the, 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 the W that I got from CBB inverse of the optimal B is actually feasible for the corresponding dual. Any questions up until now? Is everybody with me? Or is it too early to follow a proof? All right, let's go on then. We have proved that this W is feasible. Now, is it optimal? Well, let's just check the objective function values because if they're equal, I can neutralize corollary one and declare that this W is optimal because corollary one was saying that take a feasible X and a feasible W, if objective functions are equal, they're optimal. Now I have an optimal uh, X, so it's feasible. Now I have a feasible W. Let's see if the objective functions values are equal. Well, my CX star I got from my table, row zero, CBB inverse B. That's what's supposed to be, right? Well, and that is my WB. So corollary one immediately tells me that this W is optimal. Fine, we have proved that. Uh, let's go back. So we have proved the strong delta theorem. We utilized the if statement. It was saying that if X has an optimal solution, if one of the problems has an optimal solution, so does the other. So we took an optimal solution from primal, uh, and we proved that the dual is also optimal, right? And we also utilized that this optimal primals basis will actually give me the optimal dual solution, which is CBB. That finishes the proof of strong data theorem. Any questions? <clears throat> Any questions? Okay. Now, in the proof of the strong delta theorem, we utilized one important thing. We see that for an optimal solution, <clears throat> for an optimal primal solution, I can immediately deduct the optimal dual solution, CBB inverse. 
Now, CBB inverse is interesting because I keep seeing it in my table, yeah? <clears throat> Let's remember the simplex table. Well, let me clean this up a bit. All right. Now, oh, can everybody follow me? Apparently, someone else is trying to enter to the Mitachio Ruhanfi as a, as a, all right. Can, can you follow? Do you still with me? Okay, thank you, Didam. I needed an answer because my screen says someone else is trying to log in to Mitachio Ruhanfi, but <laughs> I, I'm having this place. I'll hold the guards. I'll defend the castle. All right. <clears throat> now, uh, so why the strong dotted by the, by the, well, the, during the proof of the strong dotted theorem, we have seen that the optimal dual solution is CBB inverse. Okay. Now let's look at an, any, any uh, simplex table corresponding to any B, right? Now, CBB inverse mm -hmm. is there. Right? So that means if I solve the primal solution optimal with the simplex iterations, I can find my optimal dual solution from my optimal simplex table because it's always there. Where is it? It's underneath the starting BFS because this is what I assumed. This was my structure. So I have enough slack variables and I started my simplex with my slack variables. Again, my CBB inverse, which is my optimal dual solution, is actually hidden underneath the um, starting uh, BFS. Okay. Now, let's go over an example and find out the values of my optimal dual uh, vector from the optimal primal solution. Okay. Say so this is where I start with. Okay, I have a maximization problem with these constraints. Okay, the, I can't work with this in simplex, so I have to convert it to the standard form. The first constraint get a slack. The second constraint get an uh, excess variable. The third constraint is already at equality. Well, I cannot start simplex with this, and I told you the um, dual variables is underneath the starting BFS. Now, this cannot start like this, so I needed an artificial in here, in the second constraint, and in the third constraint, right? So, okay, um, my starting BFS then, starting BFS is S1, A2, and A3. I have two artificials to start my simplex algorithm. Fine. Well, I'm supposed to do big M and... This is my optimal simplex table. Let's say we applied enough big M iterations. If you want to have examples, you can do that. But this is already from Winston, the, the textbook anyway. All right. No, CBB inverse is underneath the starting BFS, meaning here, here, and here. All right. Okay. But be careful, there was M's in the original thingy, so I need to get rid of those M's. If this is my CB, optimal basis, let's go back. X3, X2, X1, right? Okay. The basis corresponding to these guys are the column of X3, the column of X3, which is uh, the column of X3, Two, two, minus one and five. Then what was the second? X two, which is three, two, and one. And the third optimal solution was X one. So my one, zero, two. This is my B. All right. Now the B inverse is here. It's again underneath the optimal uh, starting BFS anyway, remember? Uh, underneath the starting BFS, this should be my B inverse, which is that actually, right? And CBB inverse, if you do the multiplication, you're going to get these values, which are underneath the, the starting BFS. Okay. 
So this is just a quick hint for you to follow and find, uh, find out what actually is going on uh, in the simplex table. All right? Then, what have we learned? We learned that if we have an optimal in the primal, if primal is optimal, so is the dual. And this is an if and only if type, because if dual is optimal, then primal is optimal. It's, if one of the, this is strong delta theorem. If one of the problem is optimal, so does the other one. And the optimal basis in one of the problem will give us the other optimal dual solution by CBB inverse. Okay? All right. Corollary two of weak delta theorem, if one of the problem is unbounded, the other one has to be infeasible. There is no other way. And if the one of the problem is infeasible, the other one is either unbounded or infeasible. It can never be, it can never have an optimal solution because if this, then this brings us to a situation where the other one has to be optimal too. All right? Any questions? Okay. This brings us to my favorite of the Dalton theorem. So we have seen weak Dalton theorem. We have seen strong Dalton theorem. Now we're going to see complementary slackness. There are three basic dual theorems, actually. And they are uh, very much used in the optimization theory. Now, what is complementary slackness? Let me go over uh, the theorem first, and then we're going to prove that it holds. Okay? Um, we're taking a primal problem. Now we're taking a dual problem, okay? So this is my primal, max Cx, subject to Ax less than or equal to Bx non-negative. My dual is minimized Wb, subject to Wa greater than or equal to Cw non-negative, okay? Com uh, canonical form, max min pair, okay. Now, normally, <clears throat> This less than or equal to constraints are always associated with slack variables so that we utilize our simplex algorithm. And of course, this greater than or equal to constraints are associated with excess variables. Fine. Now, here's the theorem. Let X and W be any pairs of feasible solutions for primal and dual. Okay, so we pick a feasible solution for primal, we pick a feasible solution for dual. So that's what the if statement states. We have a feasible primal and a feasible dual. Now, the theorem says, and it's a very <coughs> powerful theorem, if and only if time statement, um, the dual variable multiplied with the slack of the corresponding constraint should be equal to zero. And the primal variable multiplied with the excess of the associated constraint should be equal to zero. That is called complementary slackness conditions. This is it, the dual variable with the slack and the primal variable with the excess, okay? It's a very, very powerful theorem. Let's read it again together. We pick a feasible solution for the primal, let that be x. Then we pick another feasible, well, we pick a feasible solution for the dual. Let that be W, okay? Now, these guys are optimal if and only if they satisfy complementary slackness conditions. So, first of all, if these guys are optimal, that means they have to satisfy the optimal uh, complementary slackness conditions. And the second way, if these guys satisfy the complementary slackness conditions, then they must be optimal. Okay, so this is another way, um, uh, this is a different way by saying that, um, well, strong delta theorem is different. It's, a, it, it's mainly on the existence of the optimality. This one is actually, I don't know if and only if, and the complementary slackness conditions, believe me, are very handy in driving um, the optimal solution of the other problem. You don't usually have the basis on your hand and blah, blah. Okay, let me go over the proof, okay? Now, the proof, as I said, should go in two ways. So it's an if and only if type statement, so I have to prove this way and that way. I have to prove if, then, and then I have to prove then, 
then this is true. All right. Okay. So this, this way is if they're optimal, respectively to their respective problems, they have to satisfy my complementary slackness conditions. Before I go deep in the proof, are you all okay in understanding the conditions, the complementary slackness conditions? Any questions regarding this theorem, strong delta theorem, weak delta theorem? Hojam, can you once again explain where those AX minus B and C minus WAs come from? Sure. They're actually, now let me go back. Thank you for the question. Um, let's look at our primal and dual problems, okay? This is my primal and this was my dual. Okay. Uh, the theorem says, there, let, let, let's take an X from here. Okay, I take an X from here. And I take a W from here. X is a vector. W is also a vector, right? Okay. Now, uh, this version is the vector form, so this is a vector and this is a vector. Or you could have written WI times, uh, the difference in here is of WJ times EJ, and here I have SI. No, C minus, hold on, I made a mistake, and this actually causes problems. Let me go back here, all right. Now, AX minus B is actually SI times WI, and this part is EJ times XJ. Okay, now the theorem says if they're optimal, I was in a finale statement, so if they're optimal, then they have to satisfy these interesting conditions. These are called complementary slackness conditions. Now let's see what that condition actually states. It says the W vector, the, the, the dual, now remember each constraint is associated with a dual variable, right? For each constraint, I have a dual. Now, if this constraint has a slack, meaning if it is not equal to bi, then the w multiplying that should be zero. Then the w vector, uh, w associated for that constraint should be zero. Because for each primal constraint, I have a dual variable, right? So this part says, if the, dual co if the constraint is not binding, if it is not equal to, it's an equality, it's an ax, less than or equal to b, right? They can be equal or strictly less. Now, this constraint, the first part of the complementary slackness says, the dual variable multiplied with its constraint, because each constraint in the primal has a dual variable, their multiplication should be equal to zero. This is from this part. From the dual's part, that's the second statement, I'm writing a constraint to each to the dual problem for each variable in the prime. So the, the primal variable multiplied with the constraint that I'm writing for it, the, ex, the slack, excess, whatever, the leftover in the constraint should be equal to zero. These are actually complementary slackness conditions, okay? So if these X and W are optimal, they have to satisfy these conditions. And if they satisfy these conditions, they have to be optimal. This is the complementary. Is it clearer now? If so, I'll go over the proof. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, then. Let's go on. So I take an optimal. It's an if, right? So if the first part says if they're optimal, they have to satisfy the complementary slackness conditions. All right. So I'm taking an X optimal and a W optimal. Uh, Okay, now I have to satisfy that these guys satisfy the complementary slackness conditions. First of all, uh, maybe I utilize my board in here too. And hold on. Okay. X bar is optimal for P and W bar is optimal for D. This is what I know, right? Now I'm supposed to prove that they satisfy W bar multiplied with AX bar minus B should be equal to zero. 
and C minus W bar A multiplied with X bar should be equal to zero. This is what I have to show, right? Okay, now let's see what I have. Now, uh, my original problem was maximizing Cx subject to Ax less than or equal to Bx non-negative and minimizing Wb subject to Wa greater than or equal to Z. I did, I did have canonical for max min pair to start with, right? Now, my x bar is optimal, so it has to be feasible anyway. So I know that Ax bar less than or equal to B. Yeah? I also know that W bar is positive, so I can easily write WAX bar less than or equal to W bar B. Yeah? And then if you play with it, WAX bar minus W bar B less than or equal to zero, that brings us to W multiplied with AX bar minus B less than or equal to zero. Okay? I'm just playing. Nothing. Yeah? No rocket science. Okay. From the other way around, so this was from the primal's feasibility. From here, what can I say? W bar A is feasible, so W bar A is greater or equal to C. X bar positive. And I know that these guys are optimal, so their objective function values should be equal to each other. If you plug all these things in, you have this thingy greater than or equal to zero and equal to zero. Which brings us to immediately the complementary slackness conditions. I won't go into e either e each detail because it's really the, this 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 is the thing that I did for one part. You are supposed to do it for the other parts too. So, what we have seen, we have proved that if these if they are optimal, because I utilized uh, where it is here. I utilize that W bar should be equal to CX bar. That's why it's only true when they're optimal. Okay? So from feasibility, I've seen that these are true, W bar AX bar. And then from the optimality, I plugged in W bar equals CX bar, and I showed that they have to be equal to zero. So if I took two feasible points, X bar and W bar, if they're optimal, they satisfy complementary selectness conditions. Be careful, though. The feasibility is in the upper part. They, it have, always have to be satisfied. Let's read the statement again. Let these be any feasible pairs. So the, the theorem is only valid if you start with two feasible points. Okay, if we take a feasible primal, feasible dual. All right, then if and only if starts. If they're optimal, they have to satisfy the complementary selectness conditions. We just proved it. Now we're going to prove that if they satisfy the complementary slackness conditions, they have to be optimal. Let's read it. Now this is the second part. If this is true and this is true, then complementary slackness conditions. If the complementary slackness conditions are satisfied, then I have to have my uh, both feasible solutions should be optimal to their respective problems. Let's see. I can utilize this fact because that's this part is what I'm proving. So I can utilize the complementary slackness conditions. I'm assuming that the complementary slackness conditions are satisfied, and I'm proving that uh, the respective feasible solutions are optimal. So I know that this is true and this is true. If you just add them up, this is what you're gonna get: W A A X bar W bar B C X bar W A X bar equals to zero. Well, these guys cancel out each other, and we have just seen that their objective function values are equal. And there are two feasible points with giving the same objective function value by corollary one. I can easily, safely state that x bar and w bar is opt for t. So we have proved the complementary slackness conditions. What are the complementary slackness conditions? For a primal dual pair, pick feasible points for their respective problems. Now, uh, these feasible points are optimal if and only if they satisfy the complementary slackness conditions. Any questions? If not, I'll go over an example. 
let's also go through this implication slide because it's actually the machinery of the of the theorem. So, if a variable, if my if if x, say if my variable is in primal, if x is positive, that means the constraint I have written for that variable in the dual should be satisfied at equality because I need to, their multiplication to be zero. Yeah. Also, if W, if my dual variable is positive, that means my constraint that I have uh, de defined this variable for should be satisfied at equality. Okay. Also, from the other way around, if my X, if I put my, plug my X in, and if I have strict inequality in the constraint for the dual, variable, that dual variable should be zero, okay? And also, if uh, in my dual the constraint is not binding, then that constraint is written for a primal variable anyway, that variable has to be zero. These are the implications, the, the machinery that we're going to be utilizing from the complementary slightness theorem. Any questions? John, what do you mean by binding? Hmm. Thank you. Binding means now if this is my constraint, right? That means I'm okay with equality and strictly less. For some parts, for some parts, I may have for, for a fixed i, so this if this is true, then it's not binding. Okay? Let's say, let me, let me uh it's not easy in the, in the matrix form. Let's say then that, let's say 3x1 plus 2x2 less than or equal to 5, 2x1 plus x2 uh, less than or equal to, uh, let's say, 4, okay? Now, if x1 is 1 and x2 is 1, okay, the first constraint says 5 less than or equal to 5. That is binding. <coughs> the second one says... 2 plus 1, 3 less than or equal to 4. So this is actually 3 strictly less than or equal to 4, not binding. But in this x point, for this x vector, and if this is my ax less than or equal to b format, okay, for this vector, the first constraint is binding, and the second constraint is not binding. Okay? Okay, Ajam, thank you. You're welcome. All right. <coughs> Any questions? Let me go over the theorems once more. All of it. Weak duality, strong duality, complementary slackness. Be very, very careful because <coughs> this topic is actually the theory of optimization and it's very open to proof type of questions and I want you to be uh, confident with all the important theorems. Weak duality. Take a primal dual pair. Take feasible points from each. Be careful. The, the, be careful in learning the statements of the theorem too. Okay, the theorem is only valid if 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 the if statement is okay. So we the ultimate theorem assumes that they have feasible points. Then it says if they have feasible points, the one that you're minimizing is always an upper bound. Fine. The corollaries, when they're equal, they're optimal. If one of them goes all the way through, that means there is no bound for the other one. So that's the invisibility. Then we have seen strong delta theorem. Strong says if one of the problem has an optimal solution. That's it. Okay. So the if says if one of your primal dual pair has an optimal solution, then so does the other. Okay. And also, well, you can drive the optimal dual solution by the optimal primal basis, CBB inverse. That is strong delta theorem, okay? Complementary slackness, that's an interesting theorem. It says, pick feasible points from primal and dual. Okay, pick an X and a pick an W. Then the statement comes. These guys are optimal for their respective problems if and only if they satisfy complementary slackness conditions. So complementary slackness conditions being uh, this version is easier to remember. W, dual, vec dual variable multiplied with the slack of the constraint. So, so this, for example, in, this, uh, in the thing I've shown you, 
on the right hand side of the board, the W corresponding to this constraint will be equal to zero because this constraint is not binding for my X. Okay? And also, so the W times the slack, that means there is a slack in here. The slack variables should be equal to one so that I have equality in the simplex algorithm. Multi all should be zero. And the variable X itself times the, the excess variable in the dual should be equal to zero. And this is a pin on if. So go back, uh, take pr feasible primal and dual solutions. Now, these guys are optimal if and only if they satisfy complementary slackness conditions. Okay, any questions from the theorems? If not, we're gonna uh, have a couple of examples to utilize, to learn how to utilize complementary slackness conditions. Any questions? All right, then I'm continuing. Okay, it's in dimension two. So we will easily see what's happening in the primal and also what's happening in the dual. We will follow because this is the first example I do. Okay, maximizing x1, 2x1 plus 3x2. We have three constraints. And then negativity. This is, a, uh, is this in standard format? Yes or no? The first answer. Can you take the dual of this? No. Yes. Very good. Because I have at least one constraint for due to this guy. This is not in the standard form, but I have to deal with all of them anyway. So here it comes. Um, hold on. This one is associated with W1, W2. And W3, I have three constraints, right? Since this is a reverse, W3 should be reverse. W1 and 2 should be non-negative, right? And it, since everybody is non-negative, in the dual, my constraints will be in the correct form. Let's look at the dual. Minimizing, this was my primal, so this goes with W1, W2, W3. Let's take the dual all together. Minimize WB, 4 W1, 2 W2, and W3 in my objective function. My constraints, the one that I'm writing for X1, I have, I see X1 in two constraints for W1 and W3. W1 plus W3, its objective function coefficient is two. X1 is non-negative, so this constraint will be in the correct form. So W1 plus W3 greater than or equal to two. X2, appears in the first two constraints, and x2 is non-negative, so w1 plus w2 greater than or equal to 3. Fine. The first constraint, w1 and w2, are uh, um, defined for the first two constraints, which are in the correct form, so they will be non-negative. w3 is defined for a constraint which is in the reverse form, so w3 should be less than or equal to 0. This is my rule. Fine. I'm supposed to find the w vector, so I, I have to find W1, W2, and W3 by utilizing complementary slackness conditions. Now, what I can do is that the primal is in dimension two. I'll solve the primal, get my optimal X star, and utilize the CS conditions to find the values of my W. Before I go on, is everybody confident in how I take the dual? If you have questions there, I believe I can answer that one too. All right, then. If you plot this in dimension two, you're gonna see that two, two is optimal for my primal. All right, now we're gonna utilize that information in order to find the optimal dual solution. Now, what was my thingy? I have to have AX minus B multiplied, oh, here it is. Multiplied with W equals to zero, yeah? So W one times, uh, let me write the primal and dual here because I may need that. So maximizing 2x1 plus 3x2 subject to x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 4, x2 less than or equal to 2, x1 greater than or equal to 1, x1, x2 non-negative. This goes with w1, w2, w3. And my dual is minimizing 
4w1 plus 2w2 plus w3 subject to w1 plus w3 greater or equal to 2, w1 plus w2 greater than or equal to 3. Uh, I, w1 and w2 are negative, w3. Oopsie, sorry. W3 less than or equal to zero. Okay, subject is here. All right, now let's go back. I have an X. My X is 2, 2. My X star is 2, 2. So X1 equals to 2, X2 equals to 2. Let's utilize that fact um, in the complementary selectus condition. The first part is W times AX bar minus B equal to zero, and I will have WA minus C times X equal to zero. Yeah? Okay. W1 multiplied with the slack in the first constraint. W1 multiplied with X1 plus X2 minus four. Should be equal to zero. W1 times zero equals to zero. It doesn't give me any information. Next statement. W2 times X2 minus two equal to zero. X2 is zero, two. So if you plug it in, it again doesn't give me any information because it's already zero. The third constraint says W3 multiplied with X1 minus one should be equal to zero. Well, if you do that, we fix W3. All right, W3 is zero. Now, this, this was the first part of the complementary slackness conditions. There's another part. Let's look at that. WA minus C times X should be equal to zero. Since both of, uh, so W1, let's look at the dual. W1 plus W3 minus two multiplied with X1 should be zero. X1 is not zero, so my W1 plus W3 should be equal to two. I have already found that W1 is zero. This immediately gives me that W2 is two, okay? The third constraint is W1 plus W2 minus three multiplied with X2 should be equal to zero. X2 is not zero, so I have to have equality from here. That brings me to this vector. Now, be very careful. We have derived the W vector, which is two, one, zero. Before declaring that it is the optimal dual vector, we have to first prove that it is feasible. Because I can only use complementary slackness condition. Remember, always know what the statement starts with. This one was saying that pick feasible solutions. Okay, I have to have a feasible X and a feasible W. Then, well, these guys are optimal if they satisfy their complementary slackness condition. So I always utilize the fact that they should be feasible. So once you find the W vector, okay, this X and this W does satisfy complementary slackness conditions, but first I have to know if they're feasible or not so that I can say, oh, due to complementary slackness theorem, these guys are optimal. In order to say that, I have to be sure that they are feasible for their respective problems. Well, I have solved X anyway, that is optimal and feasible. The W I deduct, by using the complementary slackness conditions. So first I have to see if it is feasible or not. Is it feasible? W1 plus W3 equals to two, fine. W1 plus W2 equals to three, fine. My conditions are satisfied. W1 and W2 is not negative. W3 is allowed to be negative, but it's zero anyway. So yes, my conditions are satisfied. Then I can say that, yes, uh, my optimal dual solution is 2, 1, 0. Be, uh, just a quick check. If you plug in their values in the objective functions, in their respective objective functions, this one give you, will give you 10, 2x1 plus 3x2. And if you plug the values in here, 8 plus 2, it will also give you 10, of course. Like the device, the duality, it's also true. Yeah? Any questions? Hocam ben bir yeri kaçırdım da sorabilir miyim? Tabii ki. X star 2, 2, 0 neden oldu acaba? Because I solved it with the, the graphical solution. Ah, okay. Thank you. Okay.
Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's have a 10 minute break. In the next hour, I'll start following this example, uh, which is pretty. Uh, and in the meantime, you may try to take the duel of it. And if you have any questions regarding any of these theorems, you can ask me. All right? So I'll stop uh, the video for this hour and we'll meet again at 10, 9 40.